Wonderful. So we might as well uh, get started. Welcome to our second lecture in the Dalhousie Health Law uh, Institute Health Law and Policy Seminar Series. I'm Sheila Wildman. I'm the Associate Director of the Health Law Institute. We're grateful to convene with you in person today, as well as also uh, folks online in Mi'kma'ki, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. Uh, we pay respect to the Indigenous knowledges held by the Mi'kmaq people and the wisdom of their elders past and present. We honor and acknowledge also the histories, contributions and legacies of African Nova Scotians who have lived in this territory for over 400 years. Our speaker today is Professor Martha Jackman. Professor Jackman has for decades been among the most important innovative scholars and strategists of domestic and international human rights law with a focus on challenging the state's role in creating and perpetuating structural injustice through a focus on socioeconomic rights. Professor Jackman joined the University of Ottawa Faculty of Law in 1988 and has held a variety of leadership positions there and on national bodies, such as the National Association of Women in the Law and the Women's Legal Education and Action Fund since then. As a scholar, activist, and lawyer, she has participated in both spectacular human rights wins and a couple <laughs> spectacular fails uh, and has contributed not only uh, through her academic writing, but as counsel for equality seeking litigants in some of Canada's most important human rights cases, engaging equality as well as security of the person and the interaction of those, including Eldridge and Chauli. In her hands and those of others, I think it's fair to say that even the fails uh, come off as carefully written postcards to a more enlightened future. Professor Jackman's legal advocacy has been celebrated in numerous ways, including a 2007 Law Society of Upper Canada Medal and a 2015 CBA Touchstone Award. We're so lucky to have her join us to share her experience and imagination on how law may be harnessed, unwilling as it may be, to projects of transformative social change. Please welcome me in joining. Uh, uh, so please welcome me. Uh, welcome me in joining Professor Jackman. Please join me in welcoming Professor Martha Jackman. Just down here. Thank you. Thanks so much, Sheila, that for that very generous uh, introduction. And it's really great to be here in uh, Halifax, one of my favorite places, not least uh, because uh, my fellow traveler, Vince Calderhead, who I'm sure many of you know, has done some amazing work from here. So as I tell all of my students in all of my classes, uh, law generally, and the charter in particular, are indeed a tool and terrain not only for social justice, but also for social injustice, and sometimes uh, all four things at the same time. And how law and the Charter operate in relation to health and access to health care uh, is, of course, no exception. From the very early years of the Charter, uh, there were promising examples of Charter rights uh, being deployed to promote um, access to health and to determinant of health uh, rights. Uh, Morgenthaler, which of course continues to be very relevant here in the struggles you're having around access to abortion, uh, and Eldridge in particular, as, uh, as Sheila mentioned, uh, one of the earlier, earlier cases that I was involved in and actually almost the only win uh, quite some time ago. But there have also been disheartening examples of the uh, charter as a source of health wrongs. And the most egregious example, of course, is Shaoli. And again, maybe sour grapes. I was involved in that uh, spectacular loss. 
After the hearing, I actually thought Justice Deschamps was going to rule in favor of the Quebec government, so really called that one wrong. Uh, but aside from Shaoli, there have been multiple uh, determinant, social determinant of health related claims that have either been struck before they've even been argued, that have been lost, and where appellate courts, including the Supreme Court of Canada in particular, have refused leave to appeal, including in some big cases here in Nova Scotia. So in my remarks uh, today, I will examine the charter as a source of health rights and health wrongs, and I'll do that in three parts. First, I will very briefly remind you how section seven and 15 operate as a basis for right to health claims. Second, I will talk about how the charter rights claims in rights claim in, two, in the Toussaint v. Canada case, or in the case of Camby surgeries from BC, charter wrong claims, have been framed and assessed on doctrine and evidence. And then finally, and probably fairly briefly, I will uh, examine the significance of those two cases for other emerging health and determinant, determinants of health related claims, in particular, uh, the issue that I know many of you are working on, including Sheila, uh, the issue of decriminalization and safe supply uh, of drugs. So first, uh, if your first year charter course is a ways away, uh, Section 7 and 15 is a source of access to health care claims. As you remember, Section 7 guarantees the right to life, liberty, and security of the person and requires any a violation of those rights to be in accordance with the principles of fundamental justice. And again, as you may remember from your first year charter course, uh, the Morgenthaler case around access to abortion, Shaoli around access to private care, Insight in relation to access to safe injection services, and Carter in relation to access to medically assisted death were all primarily grounded in the Section 7 guarantee. Uh, Section 15, of course, uh, an even more promising history and text. Section 15 guarantees equal protection and benefit of the law without discrimination on both enumerated and analogous grounds. Uh, and as I mentioned, the Eldridge case, which was a, a really important victory where the BC, uh, uh, the Supreme Court of Canada recognized that failure to ensure access to interpretation services for the deaf within the single pair system was discriminatory, uh, a, an important case relying on the section 15 equality guarantee. And both sections seven and 15 were relied on by the claimants in the Canby surgeries case and in the Toussaint case. However, the rights claims in the two cases were formulated very differently. Uh, in Canby surgeries, uh, the appellant, Dr. Brian Day, relied on the Shaoli case to argue that all of the restrictions in BC health and hospital insurance registration, uh, legislation on access to private care were unconstitutional. Um, the trial court, and this was a litigation that went on in terms of motions and counter motions for about a decade before it got to trial, but it did eventually, uh, it was eventually heard on its merits. Um, Dr. Day had acknowledged that he was engaged in illegal billing practices, and he argued that that was okay because the regime was unconstitutional. Uh, and happily, the trial judge uh, in Canby surgeries disagreed with him. Um, the court did agree with Dr. Day that delays in access to health care um, where in a context where the single payer system had an effective monopoly was a violation of some patient's right to security of the person because people can become more ill on waiting lists. But the trial judge, as was the case in Shaoli at trial and at the Court of Appeal, the trial judge found that any violation of security of the person that resulted from the single payer monopoly was not, did not violate the Section 7 principles of fundamental justice. It was not arbitrary because those restrictions are designed to protect the viability of the single payer system and to ensure that in British Columbia, access to care is based on 
need and not ability to pay. And the BC Court of Appeal agreed with the trial judge, although the Court of Appeal did find that in addition to security of the person violations, the, uh, there were potential right to life violations uh, in terms of people dying on waiting lists. But again, the BC Court of Appeal agreed with the trial judge and indeed with the lower courts in Shaoli that restrictions uh, within provincial health and hospital insurance legislation based on the conditions of the Canada Health Act designed to prohibit or to restrict private duplicative care were not arbitrary or grossly disproportionate. And again, the Court of Appeal agreed that these provisions, uh, including the prohibition on uh, double dipping, private health insurance, were designed to protect the single payer system and the important value that people in British Columbia have access to care based on need and not ability to pay. Uh, I had hoped that uh, Dr. Day had given up. Uh, he announced when he lost at the Court of Appeal that he did plan to appeal. And so in the end, I phoned the AG lawyers and indeed, apparently uh, last week, uh, Brian Day did file his leave to appeal motion. It's not on the Supreme Court site yet, but no doubt it will go through, uh, go through the process in Shaoli both uh, the trial and appellate judge ruled against Dr. Shaoli and on the evidence and the Supreme Court granted leave. So the fact and can be that the trial judge and court of appeal ruled in favor of the government on the evidence, I don't think will necessarily dictate uh, the outcome of that leave to appeal. And I do actually expect the case to make its way to the Supreme Court of Canada. In the Nell Toussaint case, which is also a long ongoing case, uh, Ms. Nell Toussaint, who was a, uh, arrived in Canada in 1999 on a visitor's visa from Grenada and stayed on uh, without being able to regularize her immigration status. She is also relying on the Shaoli case in her uh, charter challenge, but she is arguing that the exclusion of undocumented migrants from access to publicly funded federal health care under the interim federal health po uh, program violates section seven and section 15. And as you may remember, the IFHP is the program that uh, former prime minister Harper uh, cut back uh, in terms of even ac uh, refugee access uh, unsuccessfully attempted to cut back. But he was emboldened to do that by the uh, federal court ruling in Tucson in 2010, where uh, the federal court agreed on the evidence that being excluded from um, federal health benefits when she had no ability to pay for care herself and when because of a number of chronic heart, uh, health conditions, including diabetes, meant that she was at actual imminent risk of death in the absence of of access to care, the federal court in 210 agreed that her exclusion from the federal, from federal health insurance benefits violated her right, right, right to life and security of the person. But the federal court found that that violation was in accordance with principles of fundamental justice, since it was rational for the Canadian government to deprive undocumented migrants of access to health care in order to um, discourage illegal migration. And the Court of Appeal uh, upheld the trial uh, judgment in 2011, but even went further. And it uh, cast some doubt on causality and suggested that the harms, the health harms that Ms. Toussaint had experienced were due to her own bad choices. And the Court of Appeal also agreed that the exclusion of undocumented migrants from federal health insurance coverage was rational and not a violation of principles of fundamental justice because Canada legitimately did not want to become a healthcare, uh, healthcare safe haven. Um, Ms. Toussaint then appealed to the United Nations Human Rights Committee under uh, availing herself of the optional protocol to the ICCPR. She argued that her right to life was violated by 
the federal government's exclusion of undocumented migrants from access to care and her right to equality based on migrant status. And not surprisingly, the UNHRC uh, agreed with her and issued views in 2018 to the Canadian government, um, recognizing that Canada had violated Ms. Toussaint's right to life, as well as her right to equality under Article 6 and 26 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. And the uh, committee rec uh, recommended both that Canada provide damages to Ms. Toussaint for the harm she had suffered, which included uh, amputation of a limb, uh, pretty much blindness and a stroke that had severe consequences for her. In addition, the committee uh, told Canada it needed to amend uh, the interim federal health program to ensure that um, people were no longer subject to discrimination based on their migrant status. Uh, Canada waited a bit, but eventually in 2019, uh, told the committee that it couldn't agree with its views. And in fact, it disagreed with the committee's interpretation of the International Covenant, and that I really loved. I imagined myself writing to Chief Justice McLaughlin to tell her that I disagreed with her interpretation of Section 7 of the Charter. Um, but in any event, uh, Canada declared that it wasn't planning to take any measures to respond to the views of the committee. And so Ms. Toussaint turned to the Ontario courts and in October, 2020, she uh, brought a challenge in the Ontario Superior Court to Canada's failure to uh, respond to the views. And she, uh, she challenged the failure to provide her with the damages that the committee had recommended and also the failure to implement the systemic remedy that the UNHCR had uh, recommended in its views. She relied again on Shaoli uh, and the idea in Shaoli that delays in access to care uh, violated the right to life and to security and were fundamentally unjust. In her uh, Section 7 Principles of Fundamental Justice argument, she argued that it was arbitrary to exclude undocumented migrants. In fact, it was a false economy, discriminatory, and also violated the international uh, customary rule of pacta sunt servanda, which requires um, countries to implement their international treaty obligations in good faith. She also is relying on Section 15 and the argument that exclusion from the continued exclusion from federal health benefits and the refusal to implement the views of the committee violates section 15 based on migrant status. And she argued under admin law principles that the uh, Canadian government's decision was, was unreasonable. Yes. No problem. Thanks. Uh, not surprisingly, uh, in the fall of 2021, the Attorney General of Canada brought a motion to strike uh, Ms. Toussaint's claim. And they, the government basically took issue of all, with all of it. They said it was raised judicata because the federal court had already decided against her. Um, her damages claim uh, was out of time. Views of international bodies, and in fact, international Canada's treaty commitments in general are non-binding domestically, and the charter law is settled uh, in terms of immigration status as a prohibited ground and access to healthcare as a section seven right. In August, uh, the Ontario Supre uh, Superior Court, Justice Perel, dismissed the Attorney General's motion to strike. And again, on all grounds, he disagreed that there wasn't a reasonable cause he found that it was not obvious that the raised judicata applied. He found the law to be unsettled. Uh, and uh, he struck, uh, sorry, he struck, he dismissed the motion. AG Canada quickly uh, turned to the Ontario Court of Appeal and brought a motion to stay 
Justice Perel's uh, ruling, which the court granted, although it is uh, promising an expedited appeal of the stay, uh, sorry, the appeal of Perel, Justice Perel's decision. So going forward, what is the significance of how these claims uh, were framed or are being framed and how they are or were assessed in terms of the charter as a source of both health rights and health wrongs? So first in terms of the framing and assessment of uh, the section seven claims in the two cases, as I have written, and I think some of you uh, may have read in course assignments, uh, Shaoli, the legacy of Shaoli, and indeed the earlier Supreme Court decision in Gusne, is a double standard, both doctrinal and evidentiary, as between the treatment of the claims of the advantaged and the disadvantaged under the Charter. Doctrinally, the way this has played out is that in contrast to the claim of the advantage, those who could afford private care in Shaoli, where the Supreme Court focused very much on the right to life and security violations that were being alleged in that case, rather than focusing on actual claims uh, and deprivations of life and security, in determinants of health-related claims uh, brought by disadvantaged groups, the courts, including the Supreme Court of Canada, have consistently characterized claims, their Section 7 rights claims, as demands for freestanding rights that don't exist in the Charter. So in the Toussaint case at the Federal Court and Federal Court of Appeal, Ms. Toussaint's right to life and security claim was mischaracterized as a demand for access, a freestanding right to health care anywhere, anytime. In Tanujaja, a case some of you may be familiar with, the Ontario Tanujaja case, where the claimants challenged uh, Ontario and Canada's inaction in relation to homelessness. And uh, invoked the harms to life, security of the person, and equality that resulted from government action and inaction in relation to housing inadequacy. Uh, in striking the claim, the Superior Court mischaracterized Ms. Tanujaja and the other uh, plaintiff's claim as a claim to a freestanding right to housing. And in fact, in Gus Lane, the court, the, uh, the majority of the court effectively characterized Louise Gosselin's claim that cutting social assistance benefits by two thirds for those under 30, so that people were trying to survive on roughly $150 a month. And again, the violations of life and security of the person that resulted in Gosselin, the trial judge and uh, the Supreme Court of Canada characterized Ms. Gusslein or mischaracterized Ms. Gusslein's claim effectively as a, a claim to a freestanding right to social assistance. So instead of looking at the right to life and security claims, one court after court has mischaracterized the charter rights claims of disadvantaged groups relating to determinants of health. And Justice Perel's categorical rejection of this approach in uh, Toussaint, in the motion to strike in Toussaint, is the most significant aspect of that decision. <clears throat> and if you'll forgive me, I'm going to read from paragraph 134 of his judgment, because it was just such sweet sound to hear this. And basically what he said was, in a dog whistle argument that reeks of prejudicial stereotypes that immigrants come to Canada to milk the welfare system, Canada mischaracterized Ms. Toussaint's charter claim as a right to an optimum level of health insurance and a purely socioeconomic right, which is outside the guarantees of the charter. In Justice Perel's uh, summation, this is a fallacious straw man argument. And as Justice Perel put it at paragraph 138 of his judgment, 
Ms. Toussaint's claim is not a claim for free health care, but for publicly funded health care in circumstances where a right to life is demonstrably and not just theoretically at risk. That was absolutely out of character for the Canadian judiciary and really, really important that the claimants were able to convey to Justice Perel and Justice Perel heard the degree to which this mischaracterization of determinants to health claims as freestanding socioeconomic rights claims to things that aren't in the charter rather than life and security claims, which are entrenched. That was really, really important. Um, in the Canby case, because essentially Dr. Day was claiming a right to private care, to private funding and care, um, Dr. Day throughout insisted that he was not actually claiming a freestanding right to health care, but rather was alleging violations to life and security of the person. Um, and what is interesting about the Canby judgment, both the trial judgment and the court of appeal judgment is that the courts um, did accept uh, Dr. Day's characterization of the claim as being not a freestanding right to private health insurance claim, although it really was, but as a, a right to life and security claim. But in contrast to Shaoli, the courts were very attentive to the right to life and security claims, not only of the claimants, but of those individuals not before the court who would be too poor or too ill to um, afford private health insurance. And the Canby court recognized that the introduction of even small scale duplicative private insurance and care would create a discriminatory second tier of healthcare in BC that would ad adversely affect access to healthcare for those unable to uh, afford or to qualify for private insurance. And that, that consideration was found throughout the judgments. More significantly, and this is something we tried to argue in Shaoli, uh, but were unsuccessful in doing, the Court of Appeal in Canby recognized that if a parallel system uh, of healthcare, private healthcare, which uh, Dr. Day was demanding as a matter of charter right, if a parallel system was allowed to emerge, patients waiting for public care who are unable to pay for private care would also have a section seven claim that their rights to life and security were being violated by undue wait times. So that was, Again, a very significant aspect of the, uh, the Canby Surgery's decision. At an evidentiary level, the Shaoli and earlier Gustnay cases also created another double standard between advantaged and disadvantaged claimants uh, and between disadvantaged claimants and government defendants at an evidentiary level. Disadvantaged claimants are consistently held to a very high standard of proof relative to advantaged claimants and, de and government defendants. Their evidence is often discounted, as was the case in Gustain, or out and out ignored, which was the case in Shaoli, uh, and in the Toussaint case. In Canby, in contrast to Shaoli, the trial and court of appeal were also highly attentive to the harm to the rights of disadvantaged people at both stages of their section seven analysis. And the court consistently weighed in the importance of ensuring access to care based on need for the rights of disadvantaged uh, people in British Columbia. And that unlike in Shaoli, led the court to conclude that restrictions on private insurance and care respected principles of fundamental justice because they protected access to care based on need rather than ability to pay. Uh, as I mentioned in the Toussaint case, the federal court and federal court of appeal relied heavily on stereotype 
rather than evidence in uh, finding against Ms. Toussaint. Uh, and not surprisingly, the AG Canada relied heavily on the federal court and federal court of appeal judgments in Toussaint in defending against this new claim against Canada's failure to implement the views of the UN committee. And in the quote that I read, uh, Justice Perel called out the federal government for its reliance on stereotypes um, rather than evidence. Now, whether the Toussaint claim is ultimately struck or allowed to proceed, uh, whether the Court of Appeal and ultimately the trial court, if the case is actually heard on its merits, adopts the rigorous, the same rigorous approach to the evidence as the trial court did in Gusne, uh, pardon me, in Camby and in uh, and in Shaoli remains to be seen. Aside from the framing of the evidence and uh, and of the actual claims, there's another aspect of these decisions that remains of overarching concern, and that is the consistent hostility of the courts, including the Supreme Court of Canada, to positive rights claims. In the Canby case, the Section 15 claim was not pursued. It was very weak, and uh, Day dropped it. But the Section 7 analysis is pretty interesting in that perhaps one could say an obiter, but in paragraph 338 of the Court of Appeal judgment, the Court of Appeal suggested that when the province assumes monopoly power over the provision of medical services, it is under a constitutional duty to, insert, to ensure that health services are provided in a timely fashion, fashion based on need rather than ability to pay. So what the court in Campy recognized was what we argued in, in Shaoli, which the, was that if people who could afford care had a Section 7 right, surely people who couldn't afford care had a Section 7 right to care as well. Uh, in Toussaint, um, the, in granting the stay, the Court of Appeal really focused on the individual damage claim and did not really uh, even allude to the systemic claim. Um, certainly at the trial level, Justice Perel rejected the AG's suggestion that it is settled law that Section 7 does not uh, impose positive obligations on governments, but it remains that judicial hostility to positive obligation claims is a major, if not the greatest hurdle to determinant, social determinant of health related claimants, not just under section seven, but as the Tanu Jaja case demonstrated, more problematically, even under section 15, there is hostility, which is a, a, a textual guarantee of positive obligations, even under section 15, when it comes to social determinant of health related claims, the courts have been hostile to the idea that governments are obligated to do anything to ensure life security or equality. So the last thing I would like to address uh, briefly is the implications of Camby and Toussaint uh, for charter challenges to the criminalization of possession of drugs and to uh, potential challenges to government's failure to ensure a safe supply of drugs for those who use them. The decriminalize the challenge to the criminalization of possession of drugs actually is already in the works, and some of you may be involved in that uh, litigation. Um, that is an easier claim because it is a negative rights claim. So it will really hinge on the court's approach to the evidence and whether the, the court relies on stereotype or whether it carefully examines the evidence of the multiple harms caused by the criminalization of, of drug possession. And that will be true both for the life, uh, liberty and security of the person analysis, but also in terms of the arbitrariness uh, analysis under the principles of fundamental justice. It's gonna really hinge on how the courts treat the evidence. Are we gonna get a Shaoli Toussaint 
a federal court approach or will we get a CAMBI approach? The potential charter claim, both section seven and section 15 claim that government's failure to ensure a safe supply of drugs for people who use them, uh, that will also hang on the treatment of the evidence. And whether courts apply the same double standard or not as between claimants and government defendants. Again, in terms of evidence of the harm caused by lack of access to safe drugs and to evidence around who is disproportionately affected by the failure to ensure access to safe drugs. But even more importantly, an access to safe drug charter claim will, the success or failure will hinge on how the courts frame the claim. Again, because it is a positive rights claim, the question will be whether the court examines the actual harm to life, liberty, and security that results from state action and inaction around safe supply, or whether it adverts back to the traditional argument that there is no freestanding right to, in that case, drugs, pharmacare. In terms of sexual, section 15, as I say, there is a high probability of the same hostility to a positive rights claim to access to safe drugs, even though section 15 of the charter guarantees equal protection and benefit of the law. And the Canadian healthcare system has all kinds of uh, structures, rules, and processes in place to ensure that people who need other drugs are uh, guaranteed safe drugs. So everything from the Food and Drugs Act to the whole regime for ensuring the safety of pharmaceuticals. So we all benefit from that protection of the law. The fact that people who use illicit drugs don't enjoy the same level of protection by virtue of uh, the nature of the drugs they use or the underlying health condition, that section 15 claim will really hinge on the court's attitude towards positive rights and who claims positive rights as opposed to negative rights. So who has access to safe drugs, the provision of safe drugs and access to safe drugs through pharmacare regimes, who has access to regulation of drug safety and who doesn't, and more importantly, why not? So I would suggest that the CAMBI a case is extremely promising, especially in terms of the court's treatment of the evidence, which was rigorous and which also took full account of the impact of, allow of allowing private insurance and care on people who are poor and ill and unable to buy or qualify for private care. It remains though, even with CAMBI, which is on appeal to the Supreme Court, so we still have that question mark, that Medicare is an extremely popular program in Canada. And that is not true of access to illicit drugs. I think the fate of the Toussaint case, and in particular, the systemic claim in Toussaint will ultimately be more revealing. Because in Toussaint, you have the same hostility to a group, that is affected and that is seeking to benefit from a positive right. And you have the same hostility uh, to the claim itself. The idea that governments in Canada have a charter obligation to provide benefits when they don't want to, to groups that are unpopular. 
So the jury's out on both those cases, given the appeal, uh, application for appeal in Canby and the fact that Toussaint is still fighting to be heard on the merits and is facing potential of being uh, struck before it's even heard. So in conclusion, um, I have to say that I remain, after all these years, firmly committed to the idea that the Charter can function as a valuable accountability mechanism in terms of access to determinants of health, including health care. And while I'm not always uh, optimistic, I am absolutely convinced, and there is no doubt in my mind that this is a tool and a terrain that we must continually continue to aggressively deploy and occupy. Uh, and the cost of not doing so and of ceding that tool and terrain to uh, Dr. Day and his ilk, in my view, is immeasurable. So thanks very much, and I'm really looking forward to questions, and I I'm, I'm, hope I didn't go over time in my own comments. We have, we have plenty of time. We've got until 20 after if we, if we like to take all that time. And um, I also have folks online here, so I'm going to be watching. There's about 26 folks sitting online as well, so I'll be watching for their questions, and I'll kind of Stick up my hand from time to time. I'm saying that for your benefit, folks also who are online, if you want to put a question in the Q&A box, I will uh, read that out to uh, folks. But okay, we can open up it up to, um, to the audience. Do folks have, I can ask something just to get things started. Yeah, please don't be shy. Don't be shy at all. So one question I have goes back to this really, I think, very profound but very challenging observation that you make about the reception of evidence on the part of the judiciary. And I can't help but, uh, you know, think as an expression of that of the very different responses to the evidence, or at least in, in Justice Perel's case, the, the prospect of evidence, I guess, because, you know, he's at that early stage um, on his part. Uh, where there's just no tolerance for some of the claims that are being made by the, the federal government, really about the jurisprudence. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the trial court judge, I can't remember his name now, in Gosselin, so the first level judge there, mm -hmm. so much is riding on that first level judge and their filtering of and mm -hmm. analysis of that evidence. Um, and so I wonder if you have observations about kind of what what the strategy is in order to kind of um, uh, what is it, preempt preempt yes. that kind of stereotypical screen yes um, blocking mm -hmm. the yeah reception of the merits of the evidence that you pointed out in so many of these cases yes well I do um, and it 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 doesn't always work but one one big difference, and I've pointed this out before as well, between uh, Gosselin and then Shaoli. Gosselin and Shaoli actually both all the way to the Supreme Court of Canada is because these cases were argued in Quebec entirely in French, they were off the radar. And it was only at the Supreme Court of Canada uh, in both cases, that there were any interventions. And clearly those interventions were not that successful. But I think what the interventions did is that they, they called out, you know, what Justice Reeves did. And, and Justice Reeves, actually, his judgment was appalling. I mean, he, he right in his judgment, the stereotype about why are people, you know, complaining about inadequate assistance when the evidence shows that they, they spend, dis, you know, they're disproportionate smokers and they spend all their money on smoking. You know, and the idea that poverty is a matter of moral failing, like he, it's right in the trial judgment. But it really it wasn't that um, scrutinized outside of Quebec. And in Chaudy was worse because all this, everything was French. 
entirely unilingual French, even at the Supreme Court. So that it meant that the uh, presence of interveners was really circumscribed. And by the time it gets to the Supreme Court, so that Charter Committee on Poverty Issues and the Canadian Health Coalition was, uh, did appear in, um, in Shaoli and in Gaslein, Vince, uh, Vince and I were at the uh, Supreme Court as well for Charter Committee on Poverty Issues. You can't say anything about the evidence when you're, when you can't add to the evidence as an intervener, but you can certainly describe what happened in terms of the treatment of the evidence. But I think, as I say, by, by, by the Supreme Court, it's getting kind of late. Um, and I'm not saying this always works because in, in Tanujaja, there were several coalitions, very well-crafted coalitions of interveners, including the Charter Committee on Poverty Issues. Um, and Justice Letter didn't care. He just, he was so hostile to the claim, it didn't matter. And it was a motion to strike. So in theory, the evidence isn't even relevant. You're meant to assume that the evidence is proven. And even assuming that he, his doctrinal hostility was so great that he struck it. Canby was a completely different kettle of fish. The, having seen what happened to Xiao Li in Canby, right from the trial level, um, groups, intervener groups uh, obtain uh, party standing and intervener status right at trial. And they were very engaged with the BC government in terms of the evidence. Um, it, it, was, it was so on the public radar. And every false thing that Dr. Brian Day said was then called out in the media. There were people literally attending the trial day by day and reporting. The BC Health Coalition had a really live interactive uh, social media presence in it. And so it just, the, the issues around um, the impact of what Dr. Day was calling for on everybody else, it, it just, the court there could not ignore it the way the Supreme Court was able to do in such an unaccountable and really immoral way in my view. So this is my point about, um, about interventions in a way or the presence of um, non-governmental organizations and advocacy groups um, supporting this litigation. I know we are few and far between, we are stretched very thin, but it's really important, I think, to be paying attention and either to be participating to the degree possible in, in the court itself in the interventions or to be you know, engaged in op-eds and other forms of advocacy in the public arena. And that happens so effectively in, in um, Canby. I think it's gonna be very hard. The Supreme Court could never pull off in Canby what it did in, in Shaoli. It, ju it just can't happen that the, the media and public scrutiny is far too intense. Um, so in a weird way, that has nothing to do at all with the evidence. It has to do with calling out the AG for the kinds of, you know, what Perel calls, you know, the dog whistle arguments that are always so successful. So you can't blame them for doing it. Their job is to win the case. Um, so calling out the AG and calling out the courts when, when they rule based on stereotype, as was so much the case in Toussaint rather than evidence. Quick follow up, and then I will go to, to Matt, and then I have one online. Um, so, just my quick follow up. I just want to kind of amplify what you said and, and point it out, particularly to, to the students who are here and online, and, and the rest of us, that I asked you a question, which was kind of a, it was kind of a lawyerly question, or it had that vague kind of cast to it, like how could lawyers best kind of like assemble the evidence? in order to preempt this stuff. And your response was so interesting and it reflects your, your career of work and the work of many doing social justice litigation. Your response was to say the, the um, audience here, the, the forum here is much broader than the technical kind of litigation sphere. And so not only the intervention piece, but your piece about having people in the courtroom at the first instance, like in Canby, tweeting things or whatever. It's a really, it's in a sense, it's an unconventional response for a classroom because you're opening up 
the field of apparently like, you know, legal treatment of this claim to the field of politics. Mm -hmm. But that's absolutely the pragmatic, mm -hmm. right, approach that um, that I understand you to be. Yeah, well, law, know, law is politics. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. and that's what always pisses me off about the crits is this idea that we shouldn't be using the charter, we shouldn't be litigating you know, when they join the, the critic charter critics of the right, the idea that the, that the court is not the forum, like what? This is all politics, but I don't want to understate how brilliant and clear and keep it simple, stupid, your legal advocacy has to be. You have to be like twice as good a lawyer as the government lawyers because of, because of your uphill climb. And the demands on lawyers that work on these claims to be like amazing lawyers and to deploy every legal skill that you've ever acquired, including clear writing and clear speaking. Like you can be a government, you know, you can, when you're even, even Brian Day's lawyer, like you can blah, 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 and just a dog's breakfast and they like what you're saying and they're maybe gonna rule for you. But if you're arguing for the claimants, uh, you you just have to be so clear, and it's hard because the issues are complicated. Thank you. Right, uh, Matt had his hand up. Let me see. Thanks so much, Matt. Um, to my guest, I want to talk about the drug stuff that we uh, sort of concluded with. Um, like you, I, I hope in the decriminalization case, in some way, uh, the judge really focuses on the evidence as well. Claim. Um, there's a lot of detail on this issue we just didn't have to see. <laughs> um, uh, and I wish some of the folks across the harbor could give a citation of these drugs and, uh, uh, today. But um, I wondered if you could just reflect upon or elaborate a little bit more about the second case around six to five. In my knowledge, I haven't actually started. And I'm really curious if you have any reflections. It's kind of a technical. Lawyering <laughs> question as well, but around like how that device is constructed. Um, you know, when thinking about the jurisdictional yeah. boundaries between mm -hmm. probably it's provinces, or that's where the delivery would actually have to, have to happen. And of course, the regulator federally has a role in yeah. making sure that drugs are available on the market. Yeah. Um, and there's been this change, right, where Health Canada has actually been doing pretty progressive things, but stop short of that. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's a great question. And to be honest, the, the decrim thing is the easier one. And I have written it, it's it's on SSRN if you want to see it. It's like a, a, a like really conventional charter analysis under section seven and fifteen why uh, criminalization is a charter violation. The paper almost wrote itself. You'll note that the companion piece around charter challenge to safe drugs that I just have not had the wherewithal and I'm like spitting distance to retirement and it's kind of between me and retirement. I don't know. But anyway, because big picture, the claim is that the, and I would start with, I would start with the federal government in part for very pragmatic reasons, court challenges funding. <laughs> I would start with the claim that the failure, the federal government's failure to, the federal government's inaction, which I know is tough, but um, in regard to the safety of the illicit drug supply relative to the safety of the illicit drug supply is a section 15 violation. So at the federal level, we have the Food and Drugs Act and we have all the interventions of Health Canada to make sure that when I got my COVID vaccine, it wasn't going to kill me, notwithstanding what the uh, Danielle Smith might have you believe. Um, whereas it's there have been very, you know, inaction or ineffectual action in terms of uh, illicit supply. So you start, you could start with the regulatory double standard. Um, and then the, uh, I mean, the actual, the, the, the supply side, that 
again, is a little bit tougher because the Canada Health Act doesn't include um, doesn't include um, drugs, and we still don't have a Pharmacare Act. Like I think the minute the Pharmacare Act, if if the NDP and the Liberals do finally, notwithstanding multiple broken promises on that, that would make it easier. I think that if the decrim um, challenge is successful, then that also in a way becomes a little bit easier because that line between, but I get that like the big, the really big picture claim is protecting one, consume, one consumer of drugs and leaving the other consumer of drugs completely out in the cold. Um, but it, it conceptually it's, it's, I get it's a lot, harder because what you really, you don't want regulation, you want supply. It's not just the safe, it's the supply. And we don't, we do have supply in hospital, um, province by province, but you know, I, I get the jurisdictional issues and, and the fact that it's a focus on supply rather than regulation. Like I get it's really complicated and that's what I just myself haven't had time to really sit down and think, okay, how, how to do this and partly the other case I didn't mention which is the dark shadow over all of this is the Auton case where essentially Chief Justice McLaughlin said and it has to be doctrinally wrong but it's a unanimous Supreme Court judgment that when you're within the four squares of the Canada Health Act you can challenge discrimination but you can't she, she basically says you can't challenge the act itself it was designed to include only acute healthcare delivered by doctors and hospitals. And she basically says that is, that's immune from section 15 review, which can't be true. But if you're trying to challenge the, the Food and Drug Act or the Canada Health Act from outside, so the idea that the Canada Health Act or the Food and Drug Act does not include um, equal protection for people who consume illicit drugs, the first thing the AG is gonna argue is autonomy. So autumn will have to be reversed on that. And it is wrong, like section 15, any guarantee of systemic equality tells you, and, and I know Vince is working on this in the, in the housing, access to housing for people with uh, disabilities, like the idea that you designed it so that people are institutionalized. And as long as you don't discriminate against people who are in the institution, there's no problem, like that cannot be right. But that's what autumn says. So my answer is, I'm sorry, I don't entirely know yet, and, I'm, and I don't know if I'm going to get to it. It's, uh, as some of you know, I was motivated to, um, decrim is not my area. Criminal law, I've avoided like a theme for my whole career. I've left it to Liz Sheehy yeah. and Kim. It's like, <laughs> um, but my niece died of a, of a drug overdose in Whitehorse. My indigenous niece died, and I just promised myself I would, I would, you know, try and do something about that. But it's it's really hard. Um, Melissa, I, I see Archie has a question. Archie, I'm just gonna wedge in because this person online um, had theirs up right from the start, um, uh, and then we'll go to you. Uh, so a question is, as we increasingly see the health impacts of climate change, may charter rights be leveraged for climate action by federal government? A great question. And the answer is absolutely yes. And um, the, the climate challenges, the charter-based climate challenges are facing some of the same hurdles as other determinant of health challenges. And as you know, the two youth climate emergency charter challenges, one got struck and one's going forward. So the Mather case was just argued like a couple of weeks ago. Um, and and they, that is a, a beautiful case and, a, and beautiful legal arguments, essentially that inaction governments, actions and inactions around the climate emergency violate the section seven of 15 rights of young people who are gonna live with the consequences. And again, I think doctrinally, it's really solid, um, but it's a positive rights case to some degree. And it also is a case that's gonna hinge very much on the evidence. And so it will depend on the 
attitude of the judiciary. I think judges probably are less hostile to uh, climate cases than to uh, right to health, poverty, and immigration cases, just, just because. But yes, absolutely. And Nathalie Shalifour and some of her colleagues, um, there's a, an entire special issue of a recent environmental law journal that's devoted, I believe, to big, big paper that, that Nathalie and some of her colleagues wrote really elaborating the Section 15 claims. So there's a rich, for a long time, there was almost nothing. And in the very beginning of my career, I actually did write a few papers making the same arguments about environmental regulation as I did with health. And then I kind of got, you know, not knocked off track on that. And not a lot happened for like 20 years. And then David Boyd's done some stuff, my colleague Linda Collins and Natalie. And now I think it's, I think it's really, really, really rich uh, scholarship emerging in that. And I, in some ways, I wish the same enthusiasm was being deployed by young scholars around poverty and other uh, determinants of health as climate, but I get the climate's, you know, climate's really important. So yes, the answer is yes, and go for it. I'm, um, delighted to hear that you today about but in a number of areas, I'm particularly frustrated by the resistance of Canadian uh, courts to considering uh, the uh, input of the special rapporteurs on, on uh, the highest attainable uh, right to physical and mental health, specifically on the decriminalization agenda. Um, because it's been since 2006 that the SRs have said that uh, harm reduction in general and decriminalization in specific that should be uh, part of our, our understanding of the, of the corpus of international human rights law. So it's, it's more of a question of exasperation. Why is the Canadian Parliament and why are the courts so uh, kind of uh, immune to con even considering international human rights law when it comes to decriminalization? A great, great question. Um, and nice to see you. The, in every single case that I've been involved in since the early 90s, we have argued, CCPI has consistently argued um, international human rights norms as the inter a necessary interpretive context for, for charter rights. It's, the court rarely even mentions it in its judgment. In, in Toussaint, you get hostility to the idea. And basically, again, the AG is arguing that these, these commitments have no domestic legal significance whatsoever. And the response, the Canadian government's response in Toussaint is really classic. We disagree with your interpretation in any way. We don't have to do anything. Um, so I think it is, in a sense, sort of the same problem. For a long time, I said, okay, well, any judge that's my age didn't even get any international human rights law, wasn't even taught. When I went to U of T, we had public international law and nothing else. So maybe they're ignorant. But now, I think the last decade, it's not just an issue of judges not being familiar with international human rights law. I think the judiciary is changing. And I, I personally think that there's going to, that is going to swing the other way as you get a greater and greater cohort of judges who are not intimidated by, and in fact, some of them very fluent in international norms. And again, my point about the interventions in both in Tanujaja and in Toussaint. And I hope it'll be true in the drug decrim case um, as it moves into the courts uh, more firmly that, you know, uh, ESCR uh, net amnesty, like there's, there's been a coalition constructed that focuses exclusively on the international human rights arguments. And so they take more place, you know, rather than a paragraph or two in somebody's factum, they're actually getting entire interventions that are that are focused on this and Toussaint will be very key because what, what we're arguing in Toussaint is the failure to take into account these norms is a violation of the a principle of fundamental justice. And, and the doctrine is there, you know, like internationally, Pactus and Cervante is a, a well-recognized norm of customary international law. So even by a Le Maire's standard or, or the, uh, uh, um, Kazimi standard, it should be a principle of international just of inter, principle of fundamental justice. 
And so I hope that in the, um, in the decrim case that there will be an effort, not just to argue them generically in a way, but to argue as a principle of fundamental justice. So failure to decriminalize is not only arbitrary because it undermines your public health and safety objectives, it's, arbitrary, it's a violation of the principles of fundamental justice because it violates the principle of Pactus and Cervanta, which Canada has committed to, to, to treaties where it is, it's like universally, I mean, the Canadian chiefs of police agree with this. That's why I think the decrim one is a bit easier because society has moved in a way. Maybe I'm overly optimistic, but I feel that it's not just you know, the unanimity of international human rights bodies, it's actually unanimity of Canadian public health and even criminal, criminal policing bodies now. Um, but again, that if that the paper that the draft paper that I have for Vanessa Grubin's harm reduction book, which is available on SSRN, or you can just go to my UO website and it's there with the link. Um, I do, um, if I remember correctly, I do, I do refer to the international and human rights norms as principles of fundamental justice that would be violated. So I'm, the hostility is the same. The doctrinal uh, response, I think, I think the pen, pendulum is swinging. I hope. Well, that makes me optimistic. I'm still on mute. <laughs> <laughs> me too. <laughs> And this might be better for the two response than our own specific age, but I was just thinking upon our campaign in places where there's a general hostility towards imposing positive obligations onto the state under Section 7. Um, and yeah, there's like this very clear way to continue holding residents accountable to their health care and to their rights to vaccinations. How can social justice advocates use the living proof doctrine of constitutional analysis to kind of broaden? The traditional interpretation of the charter and kind of preemptively avoid leaving state thrust to the rules of each one cause of action. Because I noticed that is often the way that they go on the trends, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, under section 15, you shouldn't have to use living tree. Section 15 says everyone's entitled to equal protection of benefit of the law. So that's what was shocking about Tanajaja is that the trial judge said there are no positive obligations under section 15. The Court of Appeal didn't rule on that. Supreme Court of Canada refused leave to appeal. Like, unbelievable. And in Gosselin, the Supreme Court said, we're leaving the door open to the possibility that section seven could be invoked to claim a, pos a positive right, positive, to impose positive obligations. They left the door open on purpose. The trial judge in Tanujaja said there are no positive obligations. Gusne says there are no positive obligations. So the trial judge misread and overturned Gusne, and the Supreme Court denied leave to appeal. And actually, a bunch of you, I hate to say, your first year charter prof may be telling you that Gusne says there are no positive obligations under Section 7. They didn't read the case. That's not what it says. But the, the AG has argued this over and over. And we have not called them on it. And my colleagues often don't reread the case and they're teaching it. And suddenly um, it's settled law that there are no positive obligations under section seven. So we shouldn't have to talk about living tree. I wanna go back to the charter I got in 1982 and the legislative history of that charter. It, Section 15 is a positive rights guarantee and there's all kinds of context about section seven and positive obligations. The language doesn't preclude it. Deprivations, the, the language of being, um, you, you have a right and you have a right not to be deprived. Deprivation is not, and it's not a strictly, it's that's a political campaign started by my dearly departed colleague, Professor Peter Hall to shrink section seven down to far less than it was. And, you know, and Carrie Frock has done beautiful work on this originalism, like section 15, what we need is originalism, not living tree. So, and in fact, again, the latest, my colleague, one, maybe my last paper, pre-retirement, again, 
get it on SSRN. And that's what it's called, Wizen Stump or Living Tree, about section principles of fundamental justice, which Lemaire's decision in the motor vehicle reference opened a real wide door, including to the idea that international human rights norms would be principles of fundamental justice. And the Supreme Court has whittled it down to now it's just arbitrariness. And if your objective is discriminatory, so long as the means you adopt is, is rational, it gets through section seven, this makes no sense. So I, I, I love Living Tree, but I do not want to concede that the charter we enacted in 1982 does not include everything that I need to protect human and planetary health and well-being. And the idea that we need to amend the charter, or it's not there, that we need to read it like a living tree, that should be your backup. Your first, your first line of defense is it's already in there. Give me the rights that are in there. Well, ask your professors to stop assigning it, yeah. making you buy it. I don't know what it costs, but it costs a lot. Tell them to sharpen roach. It's cheaper yeah. and it's better. If there's any public law problems, still teaching that there is no positive rights obligations under section seven let us know yeah that's right leap to your feet and... yeah but we're um, we're getting close to the end of our time but i see vince had his hand up so i would love to hear Vince. Um, yeah you should definitely get yeah. the last word yeah <laughs> this is perhaps a question for the last question but it's really a question in your talk in your opinion of the Hussein case um, and just now, in a way, you flip flop, and you, there's a tendency, and I've been there many times, to say this is not to the court. This is not a puzzle of obligations case. This is a case about impact on life and security. Um, on the one hand, on the other hand, there you are just now saying, yeah, I feel the charter does include public obligations. How do we struggle with that, that binary? Yeah, and Vince, nice to see you. Thanks for everything. And if that's what I, you heard or I said, I misspoke. I, what I'm saying is what we have here is, is a harm to life and security that results from action and inaction. And to fix it, there may be a negative rights dimension, there may be a positive rights dimension, but I would ne I, I hope I would never concede and I hope I'm not being heard to say that my objection to them saying you lose because you're demanding a freestanding right to health care. I'm not saying I'm not saying that the charter doesn't guarantee me a right to health care. I'm acknowledging that the right to health care is not in the charter. It's a right to life and security. But the right to life and security entails access to healthcare based on need, not ability to pay. So it has to be publicly funded. So it's more that it's more an issue of focusing on the life and security harms through action and inaction and rejecting the idea that that means you're claiming a freestanding right. It may translate into a right to publicly funded care. But my claim is not a right to health care when that's not in Section 7. My claim is to life and security. All right. Well, there it is actually going to be a, a part two to this. And I'm going to tell you about that uh, as I just have you uh, join me in thanking Professor uh, Jackman. So thanks so much for the lecture and the conversation uh, today on charter rights and wrongs and um, and on the role of law, which includes, of course, reluctant courts, sometimes reluctant courts, as well as publics um, in this project of, you know, ensuring equitable access to um, social determinants of health uh, and more broadly, you know, distributive justice. So um, such important work. I want uh, to alert people to two things. One is that we are having kind of impromptu, fairly recently convened uh, workshop that starts at two o'clock in the same room from two to 3.30 with um, some folks attending. Martha's going to be uh, there along with a couple of co-panelists, Vince Calderhead, who you heard from uh, earlier, 
uh, today, um, as well as David Taylor, a former student who uh, has been very active in um, the First Nations uh, Caring Society case, which has a number of you know, uh, really interesting uh, angles on systemic injustice and systemic remedies. And the, um, the topic for our workshop is uh, thinking backwards from systemic remedies in health and social litigation. So you heard a little bit about the barriers to going forwards, <laughs> moving forwards, even from the ground level of, you know, getting past a motion to dismiss on summary judgment. So how much work there is to build up, but um, we're gonna be thinking about the, the remedies design uh, in these kinds of cases. And you're very welcome to come. Again, that's at two o'clock uh, today. Um, and sorry for late notice on that, but it's just a smaller event. And the second thing I want to tell you about is our next health law uh, and policy lecture, which is Friday, November 4th, same time, same place. And we love it when you come in person, but we're also very happy to have you come online. Uh, and that one is uh, Professor Jean Pra, who is the founder of the Health Equity and Policy Lab at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, oh, I just rec recognized that I misspoke. She's giving her lecture online. So this one, if you bring your warm body, you can come and spend some time at the law school and watch your screen, because uh, this is an online lecture. Friday, November 4th, same time, not exactly same place. And her topic is operationalizing health justice through the health capability profile. Okay, so please uh, join me in thanking now Professor Jackman.